when you're in your thoughts and you're being thought. That's one of the things I say. Are you thinking or, or are you being thought? And most people are being thought during the day by their subconscious mind and by the reactions to stuff that is outside of them. So Tom, I want to know what it's like to go through the day in your head. I want to know what that, mm -hmm. what that feels like. And I said, well, I'll tell you what that feels like as soon as you describe the color blue. And mm -hmm. he just looked at me and he said, I get it. He said, Linguistics are a lousy way of communicating because they cannot communicate. Again, they're limited to whatever the five senses have taken in and whatever people's experiences are in life. And so we're trying to take something that is infinite and abstract and bring it into a form that we can put into words. And like I said, words are very inadequate for that. So when they started studying the communication between the brain and the um, and the, the heart, what they found was that the brain communicates nine times as much information to the brain as the brain communicates back to the wow. heart. How's your day been going? It's been busy. Um, you know, I'm very busy with a lot of different things. Um, I mean, mostly related to my business. Um, you know, I do this kind of stuff. Um, and I have to do a lot of talks on my book. I also do some corporate coaching. Um, and I'm producing the audio version. I'm in my studio right now, as you can tell. I'm producing the audio version of It's Just a Thought. So I'm working on that uh, also. So it's a full day. Mm -hmm. I thought it was your musical studio. You still had your musical thing going. <laughs> yeah, well, <clears throat> I mean, I haven't, I still play music. I haven't played professionally for many years. Um, uh, I, you know, I just got tired of carrying equipment and being out late. Um, you know, it's a lot easier now, to be honest with you, because the, uh, the equipment has gotten so much more sophisticated and so much lighter. So whereas I used to carry about five keyboards, you could just carry one now oh, yeah. and do all the same stuff. So from that standpoint, it's pretty good. But um but anyway, um, you know, my life has been, I'm a very spiritual person and I felt at one point that I was beginning to get away from that in a lot of corporate work. And uh, so I, I actually talked to my web team and I said, you know, look, um, I'm kind of going to go more towards the spiritual end because that's who I am. It's who I've always been. And if the people want to follow me, great. If they don't, um, there's nothing I can do about that. Um, and it really, what's interesting is it hasn't changed anything in terms of the demand for me. Uh, even in this, even in a corporate world, I was really, I'm really surprised because, you know, I do presentations, and many times in the presentations I might be talking about quantum field theory, but I may relate that to. Eastern thought and people don't bat an eye. I mean, they just, uh, they, they're excited. They take it all in. Um, I mean, every now and then I kind of wince. I'm wondering after I say something, if somebody's going to be like, what are you talking about? But I find that people, um, you know, I, I really feel that what we're finding now in empirical science, as I said, and it's just the thought is the, the other side of the coin and all we're doing is improving with them. Uh, we're basically proving with imp empirical data, what information that's been around for thousands of years. And, um, so now we can invest in it. You know, if we, if we weren't comfortable with it on one side, we can get comfortable with it on the other side and invest in it from that perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially I think, uh, people at the scientific age, they have the notion that science is the answer to everything, but in reality, science is, to better use our environment to our favor, in which we mend our environment. That's why we study science, but we are all limited to our five sense senses. And so our perception of the world is limited to that five senses, no matter what we say. And if we consider all other animals in the world as well, that applies to them. So it is pretty naive in some sense to think that you can measure everything that is being generated by these five senses and say that as reality. So. I think being spiritual really counts and is acts as the bridge between the two worlds. Absolutely. And, I, you know, <clears throat> you make a really good point because if you take something like, um, you know, your eyes, you know, we know 
that we only see a very small spectrum of light energy mm -hmm. and um and the light is in the light is outside of that that's just because our eyes don't pick it up and interpret it and decode it doesn't mean it's not there and it's the same thing with our hearing as a high level piano technician which is what i did for many years um you know i can tell you that generally human hearing is from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz does that mean that there's no sounds above that <laughs> no it's just, we just don't, we our ears don't decode it so there's a reality even a physical reality that is out there that we just don't have the ability to see and i think that as you said it's very naive when people they they basically um they create their reality or their concept of reality, their perspective of their reality based on what they can see or perceive through the five senses. That's a very, very limited. Yeah, I sometimes talk to my friends about having this thought experiment of imagining a world where everyone was blind through all time history and explaining what the moon would be like. And <laughs> that's a... Well, I, that's a <laughs> I had something similar to that in... Um, I was coaching somebody one time. It was an ex a high-level executive, and he said, um, "He said, Tom, I want to know what it's like to go through the day in your head. I want to know what that mm -hmm. what that feels like." And I said, "Well, I'll tell you what that feels like as soon as you describe the color blue." Mm -hmm. And he just looked at me and he said, "I get it." I, I said, "I can't. I can't give you that. I can't give you that information." I said, "You know, that's my." conscious experience that happens within me and it's not something I can give to you. I mean, I can tell you things like I experience my day very flatlined. I don't I don't get um in terms of stress, I think my stress level is really quite low. I don't interpret things in such a way that creates stress in me. When I have a reaction, I pay attention to my reaction to my thoughts and I decide it, I'm the gatekeeper of the thoughts, so I decide which thoughts, at least most of the time. I mean, sometimes I'm taken off guard, but in general, I decide which thoughts get through, which thoughts I will allow through, and um, and that creates... W without mind control, you have no freedom, and that is mm. what I'm working towards, is like, to me, everything is about, um, <clears throat> are you aware of what your mind's doing or not? Um, and if you're not aware of what your mind's doing, then in general, you're in your mind. You're in your thoughts. There's a big difference between in your thoughts and watching your thoughts. They're two very different perspectives. And when I ex try to explain that to people, especially people who have never meditated, um, they really can't conceive of it. And, um, and they, you, know, you tell them that you know, when you become the observer of the thoughts and you are anchored in the observer, that's when you're really who you are. You know, your thoughts are happening outside of, of who you are. If you sit in a chair and you stop thinking, you're still aware. <laughs> you, like, you, you don't go away because you stop thinking. And, um, and that, again, is people, especially today, we're so overstimulated, um, you know, which I think is intentionally, you know, people have so much going on in their mind and everything is so instant. You know, you can look something up on the phone that used to maybe take you weeks to find out and you can have the information in a few seconds. If you want to tell somebody something, it happens instantly. Um, you can text them. Uh, it, everything is so instant. And so people, their minds are ramped up and in a very agitated state all the time. And this is one of the reasons why we're losing our attention span uh, because our minds are, they're being asked, our mind is being asked, our brain is being asked, I probably should say, to operate at a higher pace, to process more information and at a, at a faster pace, which it's, it's evolving to do, but it's losing its, atrophy, its ability to focus on one thing and stay focused on that for any length of time is atrophying. Uh, and we, we will lose that unless we practice meditation. Meditation is what really um, exercises that faculty. You know, we have faculties that come and go through, you know, through hi throughout history. And if you look at um, different, different, <clears throat> different cultures around the world, you know, some of them, you know, they view like the ability to heal with the mind is just, well, 
who doesn't know that? <laughs> you know, but in some cultures, if you bring that up, they don't believe it, you know. And I've, I've actually, you know, been in conversations with people that just, even though there's a, now there's a scientific field in that with epigenetics, you know, there, um, there are people that just know it doesn't work. You can't, you know, your mind can't heal your body. Like, um, and, uh, but, and yet, as I said, there are other cultures where it's like, well, tell me something I don't know, because we've known that for thousands of years, you know, so uh, it's, it's a very interesting time. You know, we're, we're, there's a major paradigm shift that is going on, in my opinion. Um, and I liken it to the days, if you look back, uh, I used to do a lot of sailing. And if you look back at the beginning of sailing, sailing was, sailboats were set up with what was called a square rig. And a square rig mm -hmm. is like what Christopher Columbus came to the United States with. If you look, go back to the Egyptians, their sailboats were square rigged. The Romans were square rigged. The Vikings were square rigged. And the problem, you know, it's basically just a square sail and it sails downwind. The wind blows behind the sailboat and fills the sail and pushes it along. And it's a very, very limited form of sailing because you're always a prisoner of the direction of the wind. And that's the reason why you would see in those early boats, they had oar stations you know, so they could have guys in there rowing. Because if they wanted to go in a direction um, that was counter to where the wind was blowing, they were forced into using manpower. So somewhere along the lines, um, past the Christopher Columbus days and everything, they figured out that if you cut the sail into a triangle and allow it to rotate around the mast, what ends up happening is the, the wind fills the sail and actually creates an airfoil. They didn't call it that because airplanes hadn't been invented yet, so they couldn't call it that, but they just understood that that was creating thrust. It was actually creating lift, and it was trying to push the sailboat in a direction sideways. But if they had a keel underneath of the water, the keel would resist the sideward motion, and what you ended up with was like a, a watermelon seed being squeezed between your thumb and your index finger, and it would, it would shoot the boat forward. And once they had that, <clears throat> everything changed because all of a sudden, explorers could go in any direction that they wanted because they were no longer a prisoner to the direction of the wind. And I feel like we're at a similar paradigm shift now because we have, <coughs> we have the understanding, we, we can prove, you know, we have uh, um, an area of science, it's the science of consciousness. I mean, we, can, we know that consciousness is outside of the body. Um, and we know that thought is electromagnetic energy. We can see it. We can see it on a screen. We can see. What do we you know mean by consciousness is out of the body? Talks, neurocardiologists found that the heart has these cells that are very similar to brain cells. Um, I think they're called neurolites. I could be wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure that's what they're called. Mm -hmm. And these, um, these cells think. And the heart actually does most of the thinking. Um, it has memory, it, um, it experiences things, uh, and it has, it, it, it basically processes information. And most of the co communication with the brain is telling the brain things like increased blood pressure, uh, pulse rate, and things like that. But when they started studying the communication between the brain and the, um, and the, the heart, what they found was that the brain communicates nine times as much information to the brain as the brain communicates back to the wow. heart. So the heart also has this electromagnetic field that goes outside of the body and it's, they can see it, they can map it. So it's not like, it's not some idea or theory, it's actually proven and they, um, they have hard data on this. That, that information, that electromagnetic information that's outside of the body has data in it. It has information and the information is about mm -hmm. you your concept of yourself, your concept of this situation the, um, you know, that you're in, the concept of the people that you're around. And your neurosystem is designed so that it can receive that information from other people's hearts. You know, so, um, and there's this communication that is going on, and this stuff now has all been proven, and there's all this study that is going into this that is showing that um, our thoughts are not as private as we used to think. Our thoughts um, communicate information out, just like you know uh, the, inf the ex 
analogy they give is like a cell phone. A cell phone has electromagnetic energy that goes out of it, and that carries the information of the text or the pictures, you know, or the phone conversation. And your heart has the same system that is um, that is going out. Now they've measured it um, several feet outside of you. I've heard it goes farther than that. Uh, it's a limitation of the devices that they're using to measure it. But the point is, is that when you go into a room, your what you're feeling and what you're thinking, other people are aware of it. And they're aware of it in ways that if they don't know anything about this, they're aware of this in ways that might be intuitive or a feeling. They're just, they're not aware that they're picking up, their heart is picking up your data. And, uh, mm-hmm. and I, what I think is fascinating is that the heart only deals in the truth. The brain, the cranial brain can do anything. And that's why, you know, like you can be in a situation where you don't really like somebody, but you pretend that you like them. Like, uh, and so what happens is, is that you, you speak in a way as if you like them because the brain can lie, you know, but the heart can't lie. So you can actually feel a, a conflict there when you're it, around the person. Is that where the idea uh, of the coherence like you, and, comes uh, in? That's just an example. Coherence, well, coherence yeah. is when... No, that's not coherence, and I'll tell you what coherence is. But I guess okay. my point is is that you can, you know, when you uh, when you're in a conversation, you are getting data on two levels. Um, the mm-hmm. heart is feeling what the person really feels, but what's coming out of their mouth can be whatever they say. So that's when you realize that um, you can feel like something just doesn't feel right here. I don't know, I just, there was something about that person that just didn't feel right, you know. Well, that's because your heart is getting different data than what's coming out. So you can get like this confusing feeling there. What coherence is, is it's a relationship of when the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system come into synchronization. And Mm -hmm. what they have found is that if you look at what they call it heart rate variability, when you look at a heartbeat, most people, well, we were, we were basically raised to think that your heartbeat is like a metronome. You know, it's just like ping, 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 ping. And so it beats at, say, 80 beats a minute, you know, whatever that your heart rate is. But actually, it doesn't. What it does is the heart changes its um, beat rate. If there's a variability between one beat to the next and then to the next. And that is based on what is happening outside of you and what you're thinking and uh, how you're interpreting the environment. And so the heart deals, so when you are able to get this synchronized and the brain and the heart are both working together and they're synchronized, then the whole system comes into sync. And when that happens, your um, your immune system goes up, uh, Your uh, your creative thinking, your decision making, your peripheral thinking, all this stuff expands. And I'll tell you what's really fascinating about this is I have uh, the, the HeartMath Institute, they have a, a, a tool, a device that you can uh, purchase, which is a Bluetooth device, and they have a, a software, a very accurate software program that you download onto your smartphone or your iPad. And this thing clips to your ear, your, um, your earlobe, and it senses the co- you going in and out of coherence. And you can train yourself to go into coherence um, intentionally. And it shows you how coherent you are and, and how coherent you're not. And I did this That's pretty very recently at a, a corporate yeah. event. And I had the people try it. And, um, mm-hmm. and I said, you know, one of the things that it shows you is that you can be, um, internally, you can be very stressed and out of coherence but it feels normal because you're there all the time. So the, your, out, your interpretation of, no, I'm not stressed, but your, your heart doesn't lie and the coherence doesn't lie. So if you put this monitor on people, they can see immediately um, what their situation is, like what is actually going on internally, you know, and how hard their, their thinking process is, their interpretation of their environment is on their body. And this is, it's so accurate that you can put you can start the session and and how how do you get into coherence um i think i should explain that first you get in the heart feels the emotions that you know we've got all these sayings you know, trust your heart um feel what your heart's telling you well the heart deals in emotion 
emotional energy because emotion is frequency energy. Um, <clears throat> it's thought energy. It's thought converted into uh, frequency energy. The uh, the heart deals in frequency energy like gratitude, appreciation, love, compassion. Those are the frequencies that the heart is basically its fundamental core thought process is. If you think about this thing shows you what what's going on is it's if you're in coherence you, your thought pattern is a very, it's like a sine wave like this if you're out of coherence it's very jagged looks like a, an ekg um <clears throat> and so you can have a thought you can put this on and you can it'll it'll just kind of be all over the place and then you close your eyes you take some deep breaths and you begin thinking about thing something that you're grateful for some you know someone that you appreci appreciation and gratitude and you'll see the thing go into coherence simply by you doing that mm -hmm. on this on the other hand you can think of something a stray th it, even if you don't think of it if you just get a stray thought of uh oh my gosh i got that meeting tomorrow i don't know i'm not prepared for it it'll pfft, it goes right into incoherence <laughs> it's it's really pretty amazing you can't fake it out so um so these, I, I did this with a bunch of, uh, in, a, in a corporate presentation I was doing, and I just passed the system around the room, and everybody would leave the room and spend about five minutes doing a five-minute session. And they were just absolutely floored. They were, they, they said, this is the coolest thing. Like, um, so ne like I said, now it's, uh, they just, they just keep expanding their knowledge and the studies, yeah, but they're it's, it's working like a physical on getting rep groups of representation people together. of something metaphysical, isn't it? <laughs> right, right. Uh, yeah, it is. And it shows the intelligence of the heart, that the heart is always aware. You know, we, 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 we used to think of the heart as just this muscle that pumps, you know, but it's not. It's not. It's a thinking center. It's a thinking nerve center. And actually, <clears throat> there are many that think that that is the seat of consciousness, is your heart. That's where your consciousness, that's where consciousness enters the physical body. That's where data from the the quantum field enters the body. You know, it enters it through the heart, and then it's the information is distributed, um, and then the brain has perceptions. You know, um, but the data is coming in through your heart, and this is why um, when you try to manifest and things like that, you think through the heart. You know, you, uh, you think that the information is going like if you close your eyes, you see the information moving out of your heart as opposed to out of your head. So, um, and there, are, there is a practice that you can do that works very well. Um, if you have a decision you have to make, you can, you can take some deep breaths, put your, th go into coherence by thinking your thoughts of, um, of gratitude uh, and, and compassion. You put your hand over your heart and then you, in your, in your m mind, you ask your heart the question, um, should I do, you know, should I do this? You, when you like a yes or no question, should I do this? And then you pay attention to what comes out. Like you'll get thoughts, feelings, or something like that. The heart is very, it, it, you know, this, this is like electricity. Electricity has been here since time began, but we didn't know it. Like um, it was always there waiting to be discovered, waiting to be used, waiting to be put to work. And that's what this is. And that's why I say we're in this paradigm shift because we're seeing this stuff and we can't, it's um, in the East, <clears throat> these were all, <clears throat> they were scientists. They just didn't, they explored inwardly and all of their, all of their discoveries were through direct personal consciousness. So they couldn't give it to somebody else. So that, you know, the monks in Tibet were going into gamma waves and meditation, but they couldn't. They couldn't tell somebody what that the experience was because it was a direct personal experience, mm. and so they were very advanced in all of this metaphysical stuff, but they had no way of, of communicating the information and uh, transferring it. I, I'm a little bit into meditation and all this stuff, and I did. You probably might know vipassana meditation, and you might have heard of it. I assume. And uh, I did, and in, the, in that course, something that we learn is that uh, your truth can only be experienced by yourself. Whatever you do not experience, you cannot accept it as, as the truth. And I've, when I did my 10-day session, I did, I did go through some sort of 
paranormal or in paranormal inside experience which is very hard to describe to a person same as what you said the monks can go into their uh, gamma state of mind and it's very hard for it to describe it to another person what you experience at the, as the truth because it's very hard to convey in some level so that's something that i uh, figured that rang a rang a bell when i heard what you t- told about meditation and i think well, coherence also kind of goes along okay. with this uh, when you go into meditation well so what we have now is that because our our you know s- empirical science always lags behind um in its ability to prove things and the reason is because it has to have technology that will validate it. So in other words, hmm. you can't prove that bacteria exist until you invent a microscope. So, you know, like, so it's always lagging behind what um, is actually there. That's, uh, and so that's why it is behind. And so those in the East, they were just so far advanced in this stuff because they were using it and experiencing it. It was like they, had, they knew about electricity and they were using it you know, for thousands of years. And then all of a sudden we've, you know, we figured out how to make electricity work for us. And now, you know, we're using it. And I, I, the reason I think this is val is valuable information is because as I said early on, now we can, uh, there is no excuse for not investing in this. And it really is an, a responsibility to understand that what is going out of you is going into the collective consciousness. And hmm. so if you're thinking, if you're living in fear, uh, all the time and in anger all the time that's what's going into the field um and so it's very important that we take responsibility for our thinking and understand that we have th- this body that is a powerful machine and it's been there all along waiting for us to discover it and to begin to use it and uh and so now we have that and now we have no reason to doubt it <laughs> because uh like just like we have all these other things that we've proven scientifically in the or in the west uh we have the same thing with this you know we have the ability to prove this stuff and it has been proven and uh just like i said and it's just a thought you know they did an experiment they're trying to figure out different states of consciousness in meditation so they brought in these what they called olympic meditators and many of them were monks, uh, and they had brainwave, you know, uh, machines on them. And what they found was that the these people could go into into gamma almost immediately and stay there as long as they wanted. Now, the scientists that were studying this said, you know, the average person goes into gamma for, as I recall, something like a uh, one and a half to two seconds several times a day. And so they said, we really can't know what this person that can go into it and stay there, what they're experiencing. And what they're really experiencing is a different frequency of consciousness, which allows them to have access to more information. It would be like um, if I put hearing aids in your ear and all of a sudden, instead of hearing from 20 to 20,000 hertz, you could hear up to a million hertz. Like um, the sounds are there. You know, like um, now all of a sudden you have access to that data. Is that going to change your perspective on what reality is? Of course it is, because there's all this stuff that's going on around you that you didn't even know before. And that's why I'm saying these are higher states of higher frequencies that um, we're vibrating at, you know, when we go to that. And that allows us to have access to information that we don't have in our normal waking state. Which is something amazing. And I, I think it would benefit us all if we consider that which gets me to another quote or something that i read when researching about you and that we are run by programs 95 percent of our day does that mean that we are operating in five percent capacity right well we're basically what that's another area that we now understand um which is that in general you know, the way that the subconscious works. And, and when we talk about consciousness in this regard, we're talking about different aspects of one consciousness. You know, what conscious mind, subconscious mind. The conscious mind is really who you are in terms of your ability to make creative, creative decisions and creativity. The subconscious mind is basically a very elegant 
a functional recording system. And its language is feelings. So in other words, what happens is when something happens out in front of you, your mind, your subconscious mind looks at how it makes you feel. And it correlates the two together. And then it stores that information. So in other words, if, um, if some particular situation makes you stressed, like uh, getting up in front of people and talking, the subconscious mind says, you know, whenever this, when, and you repeat that, the subconscious mind hab habitualizes that behavior. And so it says, well, whenever this, this opportunity comes up, he wants to feel, he or she wants to feel stressed and scared. That's because the subconscious mind assumes that everything you're telling it is the truth. And it's interpreting what you're telling it by how it makes you feel. So, you know, I've told this story many times, but I had, I had somebody one time in a coaching call that said they didn't believe that. They thought that I am thinking all of my thoughts. I make my thoughts and I'm thinking my thoughts. And, um, and so to make a point with them, I just said, did I tell you to talk? I don't think I told you to talk. I said, you need to just sit there with your mouth shut until I tell you to talk. And of course the guy got insulted. And I said, you see, there's a perfect example. I said, I knew that you had a file in your head and your subconscious that says, when someone talks to me this way and makes me feel this way, then my, re my reaction should be this particular reaction. I said, which is what you're feeling right now. I said, you didn't decide to feel that way. It just happened to you. And he's, he said, you know, thank you for the awakening. He said, I, I totally understand <laughs> now what you're saying. He said, because I didn't make a decision and I would rather not feel this way. And I said, that's right. I said, see, you are being manipulated all day long by whatever's happening outside of you. Somebody says something nice, you feel happy. Somebody says something not nice, you don't feel happy. You feel angry, you feel sad. Um, and I said, certain situations that you have instructed your subconscious make me feel stressed over this. And it obeys. I said, it, it, it's not it's not analytical, it's not creative, it doesn't have a sense of humor. When, something, when it sees you behaving in a certain way and reacting in a certain way, it doesn't say, well, I know he doesn't really want to feel this way or she doesn't really want to feel this way, so I'm not actually going to write that program. It just sees what you do and it writes the program. And now that becomes part of your personality. And that's what they mean when they say 95% of the day, when the nor uh, the nor neurologists say, or the neuroscientists say, that 95% of our day, we're not actually creatively thinking, we're running programs. The programs are just running all the time. And that has, that's the reason why I called the, on the last book, I said, you know, it's just a thought. It was like a play on words. It's a lot more than just a thought. And the subtitle was Emotional Freedom Through Deliberate Thinking. And that's what we don't do. Most of us don't think deliberately. We don't create a thought. As I said earlier, um, we're not the gatekeeper of our thoughts. We don't pay attention to how we react to our thoughts. The thoughts happen, we react, and we're in the reaction. We're in the emotional content. We feel all of it. We don't. We completely surrender to the situation, and we think that that's conscious living. And it isn't. It's you know we're basically just it's a, a puppet being a, to whatever's like being going a slave on to your reactions. Now, absolutely, absolutely, we are a slave to our reactions, unless. The, and this is the value of a, med, a simple meditation that teaches you thought awareness. And you know, like uh, you don't want to use like a guided meditation because that's asking you to think. What you want is something like a simple breath meditation or a simple mantra meditation, where you give your you give your mind a single task, and you you tell your mind, "I want you to watch my body breathe." That's what I want you to do, or I want you to repeat this phrase, this simple three-word phrase in my head. This is what I want you to do. And then you sit there and you wait, which takes about 10 seconds if it takes that long, and your mind says, this is boring. I'm going to go solve a problem because the mind is a problem-solving machine, and that's what it does. And it takes off to go find something, to think about something in the future um, or something you did yesterday or said yesterday that you wish you hadn't. And when it does that, 
your consciousness goes with it. Uh, you're, no, you're no longer the observer. You're in the experience. Whatever the, the mind is experiencing, you're in that experience. And, um, and that's being in the thought. And what happens is when you meditate like this, there's a period after the mind takes off where you wake up. And you wake up and you notice. Now you're in the observer because you're noticing. You notice that your mind has taken you off of the task. The mind has left and it's thinking about something other than what you and your will told it to do. And when that happens, th that's when the um, that's when your personal awakening happens because you have to be centered in your true self, in the observer, in order to have that perspective. And when you do that, th you have just woken up. In other words, you've noticed that you, your mind is not doing what you want, and you've noticed what the mind is doing without your permission, and you pull it back. And in those two things, there is, you've re-centered on the observer, your true self, and your willpower is strengthened because you've pulled your mind back. And that's the cycle. You know, people get upset because they feel like they're chasing their mind all the time. But in, in reality, there's no such thing as bad meditating in this regard. You're, you know, like some days your mind is very active and agitated and it's running all over the place and it's, it's like a, a child that's having a tantrum. Some days the, children, the child is very well behaved and other days they, it, they aren't. And you just accept that as part of the, it's just the practice of meditation. Um, there is no, I chased my mind a lot, so it was a bad meditation. No, it's, no, it's like going to the gym. Every time you catch it and pull it back, that's a repetition. You get a little stronger. Your mind gets a little more obedient. It's not a bad thing. So, but when that happens, as you develop that in that thought awareness, then you are given the privilege of choice. Um, when a thought starts, you have the choice. Am I going to participate in this thought? I am not the thought. The thought is happening to me. Am I going to participate in this thought? Or am I going to stop this thought? And many times I will tell people, you know, when you're having a stressful thought, if you could stop the thought, would you do that? If you Like, yeah, I would. Well, you can. You know, you just haven't you just haven't worked up to that. But you have the ability to because you're not the thought. The thought is happening to you. And so um, and just like behaviors, I had a, a very close friend that was a psychologist. At the time, and and they said that one of the most difficult things of working with people is that they can't separate their behavior from who they are. You're not your behavior. You're you know, mm -hmm. um, and so they said, like, if you, if you try to address their behavior, they think you're attacking their self-worth. But what you're, what you're talking about is the way they behave and this, in, this stored behavior that is in their subconscious that comes out every time this, every time this person walks in the room. They get annoyed, and, and that person pushes a button, and they start arguing or whatever. The, um, that is a stored behavior, and you are outside of that if you choose to be and you, you work at thought awareness and you start to exercise that faculty. It's, you know, it's just a skill. I mean, it really is that simple. It's a skill. Learning to be outside of your mind is a skill. And like all skills, we start in a place of zero skill and then we move along on this line of mastery. And we, when we fall in love with the process of mastery, then we're always content because we're always doing what we what we should be doing and what we want to be doing. I think it's the best privilege a person can get in their lifetime if one starts doing it. Uh, do you think everybody deserves to be creative? Yes. Because, of course, that is a byproduct of what comes after if you start doing this, right? Right. It is. It's freedom. I, I, you know, it's freedom. I mean, if, you, if I asked you, in any situation, would you like to be in control and at peace? Well, of course, yeah. Who wouldn't? Well, um, you know, who wouldn't want to have that skill? And that, to me, is freedom. When you cannot be emotionally moved, um, your behavior can't be dictated. 
you can't be controlled and manipulated by anything that is going out. You have like an inner peace inside of you, and that peace is 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 um it's steadfast. It's mm -hmm. independent of whatever is going on outside of you. That's real power. You know, it doesn't matter how much money you have if somebody can can make you upset at the drop of a you know the drop of a pin. Like um that's not power. That just has that just means you have a lot of money. Like uh you know so to me real power is being independent of what is going on in your external environment. And when you have that you not only have freedom from all the anxiety and the stress, but you have freedom to make better decisions with with other people. Because when people become angry with you or something, you don't see them from the ego. You see them as a person who is upset, who is hurting. And you, you see them from a completely different perspective because you're not coming from your ego anymore. You're coming from your true self. And that's the value in working at this. And, you know, so, we have such a high level of stress in the world today, uh, and there is a path out of that. Uh, and I mean, I can, I, you know, when I was younger, I was just, I was a terrible worry ward. I worried about everything. I was always stressed uh, and sometimes almost to tears. And I am so, so far away from that person. Um, and it was this stuff, the stuff that I've written about that I have, you know, worked at on my own in all different situations. Uh, that has freed me from that and so and I've helped a lot of people to discover it themselves and and become their own best teacher in this so it's it's all proven proven practices mm -hmm. uh, there's this famous quote a quote from Carl Jung that says uh, thinking is difficult that's why most people judge and we are all at fault with this because we have sometimes we all judge because we have to live in this world whatsoever and um, you say that if you don't judge you have a more equanimous mind uh, talk to me a little bit about that well judging <clears throat> I, I really work at non-judgment because mm -hmm. uh, equanimity comes from non-judgment um, when you judge, it's always based on it's it's based on past experience and usually a perception of perfection, which is skewed. Um, for example, when when um, what I have my definition of perfection is the ability to expand infinitely as as a soul as a person, um, because anything less mm -hmm. than that is a limit. You know, it's it's um, you know. So to me, it has to be infinite, and wow. we uh, because that would that to me is what perfection is, and that's what it has to be. It has to be limitless, uh, because as I said, anything less is it's well, you've gotten to this level. That's as far as you go. You know, like uh, and I don't believe that. Like um, so I look at um, I look at my abilities in what we're talking about here as being just a lifetime's work. I don't look at it like I'm not attached to some point that when I get to this point, then I'll be happy because I know that's not true because I can't know what it's going to feel like when I get to that point. And when I get to that point, my perception is going to change. It's just like when you start, when you start as a musician, you don't know anything. And so you, you would think that like, well, if I could play this song, I would think I was really good. And I experienced this as a musician. Um, I remember one time I was trying to play some some piece on the piano and I couldn't play it and I just thought I was 19 I was just getting ready to go into college or I was in my freshman year in college and and I thought like I'm no good I'm just not getting any better and so I need to I need to be organized about this I need to figure this out so I sat down and I wrote down everything I thought would was my definition of a good musician if I could do A, B, C, and D, I would be a good musician. Well, what I didn't understand then was that was based on my perspective of where I was on this line of music. And so I wrote these things down, and I immediately started working on them. And two years later, I figured five, at least five years to accomplish this. Two years later, I was, um, I was in a practice room in college, 
and it was a Saturday night, and I was playing, and I was trying to do something, and I couldn't do it. And I, got, I had the same thing. I got, I thought, I'm never going to be better. I'm just never going to be better. Like, I, I just, I'm not a good musician. I'm just never going to be better. And I was disgusted, and I went to quit for the night. And as I was packing my stuff up, that sheet of paper that I'd completely forgotten about fell out. And I looked at it. And when I looked at it, it was an epiphany. Because what I saw was that everything that I thought I would make me a good musician and that was going to take five years, I had already passed. I already, I had I'd done them, accomplished them, and I had passed them. And I was, now I was farther down the path. And I looked at that and I thought, I can do all this stuff. I don't feel any different than I did back then when I wrote this list. And I had this moment of panic where then I will never feel like I'm a good musician. But right after I had that feeling, I had this understanding that that's because there, it, music is perfect. There is, no, there is no point in music where you're going to get where you will not be able to get better. That's not going to happen. And then I saw that feeling as a blessing. That was when I really understood that perfection is not a number. It's not a certain amount. It's not a level of skill. It's none of those things. It's the ability to just infinitely expand. Now, when you see things like that, one of the first things that happens is you stop judging. You stop judging where you are in life. You start ju stop judging what you have. And when I get, if I just had that car, I'd be happy. You know, like if I just had this person as a partner, I'd be happy. It, like life is infinite and we are infinite and we are eternal. So, so and in an eternal existence, there is no place you get to. Like you're just, you're always mm -hmm. there. Like, um, because all there is is now. So it's the journey that matters. So um, I learned that judgment is what ties you. Like you can analyze because you have to analyze. Like if you're an archer and you you draw the bow and you let the arrow go and the arrow hits the target left, you have to analyze that. You have to say, I, I stored my energy. I aimed. I let it go. The arrow went left. So you have to analyze that to know how to correct for the next the next draw of the bow. But when you go, when you say, when you have a negative emotional reaction to that by judgment and you say like, um, I can't believe I missed that. Like this, this is just like, um, if you're in a tournament, you only get three shots. Now I only got two shots. Like I should have done that. I've, I made that many times when I'm practicing. Why would I do that? That all that conversation has nothing to do with putting the next arrow in the bullseye. All it does is create this self-doubt and the experience becomes one of um, exhaustion and in installation of negative um, information into the, to, into the subconscious. So when you can, that's why I called it in the practicing mind, I called it DOC, D-O-C. Do, observe, correct. In everything you mm -hmm. do in life, like no matter what it is, you can apply it to. You do, which is the execution. Like you say... <clears throat> This particular person really bothers me. I have to work with them. And <clears throat> so I am going to work at a different interpretation of my experience with them. And so you come up with a plan. And then you execute that plan. And then you observe. You stay in the observer and you observe how that went. And so let's just say that it was an improvement, but it wasn't perfect. It didn't get you... Um, to where they had no impact on you, like you still had. So you observe, and then you correct for the next cycle, and that's the cycle. You just do, observe, correct, and there is no judgment. You don't say to yourself, well, I should have figured that out the first time. I don't know why I didn't think of it. That has nothing to do with, with the situation in terms of being successful. It only makes that interpretation, it basically occupies your cognitive mind it steals RAM, if you want to call it that, if you look at your mind as a computer. It's this background task that it takes a certain amount of your, your cognitive energy to have that conversation in your head. As damaging as it is, I mean, it's going to install this information into your subconscious. But at the same time, it's also taking up some of your <clears throat> computational um, resources. And you need them to make the next execution. Like, um, because that gives you more clarity and more better decision making. And so that's why I say judging to me is um, it's generally left aside and um, and you should allow yourself to make the analysis. But then you cut it off and you make your observation, you make your 
your correction, you can call it refinement for the next, the next cycle that you're going to execute. In your mantra of uh, executing a project, the 4S mantra, sim simplify, small, short, and slow. And I would like to go to the last section, slow. You say that we should be comfortable working at a pace which you can pay attention to. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, <clears throat> I wrote in the, um, in the Practicing Mind that uh, I was very, very in demand in that field when I was doing it. I had started it when I was mm -hmm. uh, in college. I started learning the skill. And uh, at a very early age, I had a lot of credentials. And so I ended up being an in-demand concert technician. And, and it was... Um, be besides that, I had a, rebuild, a remanufacturing, very big remanufacturing facility doing big grants. And I, I tell you that because I was overbooked all the time. And so my days were overfilled with too much stuff to do. And I was exhausted. I was working 65 to 70 hours a week. So one day I had to go into the theater and I was in there all week long. Every day I had to go in and tune two pianos in the orchestra. One piano was in the orchestra and one was for the soloist. So I decided on my way into the, the, um, the concert hall that I needed a break. I just, I just needed some breathing room. I needed to slow down. I just felt like I needed to exhale. So I made this decision that what I was going to do was be intentionally slow on this, very mindful. And to promote that, when I pulled into the parking place, I took everything that had a time reference. No cell phone, no watch, no nothing. I didn't want anything that was going to let me know what the time was. And when I left the van with my tools, I walked very deliberately slow. I mean, ridiculously slow. I mean, like I, I was taking my steps to the... Uh, from the parking authority to the concert hall very slowly. I mean, I was drawing looks from people, but I was so determined that I was going to control my mind in this and that I was just going to be completely devoted to stillness and present moment functioning. And then I got to the, to the pianos, and when I got there, you know, normally I would be in a hurry and I'd be grabbing fistfuls of tools, dropping them in the piano, stripping it out, tuning as fast as I could, um, and thinking I was actually making time by doing that. But this time I took the tools out one at a time and I did everything very slowly. I mean, like meticulously slowly. Now, while I'm doing this, my ego is screaming at me that I am creating the biggest mess for myself for the rest of the day because it's saying, you know, you're going to be so late to the next call and you have calls all the way through the dinner hour you're going to get home. You're going to miss dinner with your family. This is the dumbest thing you've ever done. And I just I refused to listen to that and obey it. I just stayed with this, this very methodical slowness. When I finished tuning the first piano, normally I would just grab the tools out of the piano and run across through the chairs and drop it in the second piano. Store. But this time I wrapped everything up just like I was done the call completely. Put it in the toolbox, packed the toolbox up, walked 10 feet away and started the whole process over again. And then I walked, when I finished, I walked out to the car. Now, this was, this was when everything happened. When I got into the van and I started, the clock came on on the dash. I had actually gained 30 minutes of time. And I thought that couldn't be possible. Like, uh, I went so slow. <laughs> I looked at my watch, everything, and no, it, nothing had, I had gained 30 minutes. I had tuned, you got to remember that I tuned those pianos for 25 years, and I had tuned them many, many times. I knew how much time it took to get through those piano tunings. And so I knew I, wouldn't, I just didn't have a good day. Like, I knew that this was du the direct re result of me being very present moment, functioning and working very slowly. And I realized that the difference was there was absolutely no wasted motion. In other words, when I put the wrench on the tuning pins, there's 230 some tuning pins in a piano like that. When I put the wrench on, instead of going this way, that way, this way, that way, I just go boom, boom. And because I was working so slow, I was extremely accurate. And I, it, 
everything happened with way le- my my economy of motion was very very high it made such an impression on me that i used that for the rest of the day and i actually had time for the first time to go to a restaurant and have a civilized lunch you know usually i was eating in the van and spilling food on me it was terrible um and then i learned that uh, i could use this this was something i started to do during the day and i tell people look um when you're a beginner you're always slow in it because it takes all of your cognitive ability is a um has to be absorbed in the process in order to to accomplish it i said so one thing you can try to do to to see what this you know is to if you brush your teeth in the morning with your right hand brush them with your left i said because you, you know you're not used to that and you really have to think about what you're doing like anytime you do that if you can just make yourself slow down if you feel like your mind is running all over the place if you can just tell yourself i'm going to be deliberately slow uh like walking across the office like you know pulling the drawer out like very very slowly if you're going to, if you got to get some papers out of there you do it very very slowly very mindful very intentionally very deliberately and you will be amazed at how that pulls you into the present moment and and in the present moment you begin to feel relaxed and content it's uh it's a wonderful it's a wonderful skill uh I would love to hear what your definition of I is. Certainly you know that you're not your thoughts. I'd love to hear what your definition if that is. Well, <clears throat> I as as Neville Goddard said, um the mystic who died uh in the 1970s, I believe, your imagination is is God within you. that your imagination has the ability to create anything that you want by structuring creating your thoughts and your thoughts move inf- data out into the field and then the field begins to respond immediately to to produce that and as long as you don't mess it up with your intellect like you know for example if i say i want you to manifest $20 tomorrow it's, 20 US dollars over you're going to use US dollars. I want you to manifest 20 US dollars tomorrow. I've and I've done this with people. They go and I said no, I've shown you how to, I've told you how to manifest so I want you to manifest 20 dollars I want it to show up in your life tomorrow like uh, unexpectedly. And they go I think I can do that. I said okay, well then I want you to do 1000. All of a sudden they go that's a lot of money like um not to the field it isn't, not to God it isn't. The field's infinite. <laughs> that that that's just energy money's energy you're you know it doesn't there's there is an infinite amount of energy $20 $1000 $1 million it doesn't it's just energy it doesn't it doesn't see it that way like um your intellect and your ego sees it that way and that's what interferes with it so my perspective of i is certainly not this it's you know it's not i'm so clear it's not my body um mm-hmm. my body is a vessel that i inhabit i look at it like a car you know like we a car comes off the assembly line it's brand new everything works great you get in it and you drive it eventually stuff goes wrong you know like it needs to have some repl- some, some parts replaced or the oil changed and that's just part of owning the car as it ages eventually the car stops and it just stops running and what happens when that happens you get out of it you just open the door and get out of it like um and now you know you leave like um you're you're the driver you're not the car you know like um and the driver is not impacted by what happens to the car at all like um the driver decides how to drive the car if they want to beat the car into the ground they can do that if they don't want to take care of the car they can do that you know um but you are the driver not the car and so to me we are if you think of if you think of source god whatever you want to call it um if you think of that as the ocean like mm-hmm. we have all these oceans on the planet but there's only one ocean we just name them different names but they're all connected they're one body of water and we are all a drop in the in the water like there's you know molecules of water inside the ocean like um we're part of the ocean but we're individualized drops in the ocean 
and that is how I see myself in this um, in this eternal vast sea of consciousness. I am an individualized right now, an individualized part of that consciousness, but I am basically I am in the, God's consciousness, but God is also in me. I, I, it's a very you know what we're trying to do here <laughs> is. Linguistics are a lousy way of communicating because they cannot communicate. Again, they're limited to whatever the five senses have taken in and whatever people's experiences are in life. And so we're trying to take something that is infinite and abstract and bring it into a form that we can put into words. And like I said, words are very inadequate for that. So it's a difficult question to answer. I'll just leave it at that. I just wanted to hear what you thought about it. Uh, it's not just your thought. It's not just a thought, but your thought. This is the last chapter from your last book. Uh, it's just a thought, but make it your thought, right? Right. That should be the striving principle for people. It should be because your thoughts happen to you. Some thoughts happen to you and some thoughts you create and you want to be the creator of all of your thoughts because when you're the creator, then you're, you're deciding what your experience is going to be. When you're in your thoughts and you're being thought, that's one of the things I say, are you thinking or, or are you being thought? And most people are being thought during the day by their subconscious mind and by the reactions to stuff that is outside of them. And I think... If we've learned, I think one of the most important things that we've learned now is that our thoughts, as I said early on tonight, our thoughts are not private. Our thoughts go out of us and they go into the collective consciousness and they go into other people. And we have to take responsibility for that. If we want, if we want the frequency of this, this plane, this earth to, to rise and we want... Um, to change what we have here with you know wars and um, and <clears throat> all the suffering that it is we have to we have to intentionally participate in that and we have to pay attention to this thought I'm having where is that going to take me how is it going to affect my life how is it going to affect other people's life so I would say pay attention to how what your mind is doing without your permission and learn to control that because you have the ability and that when you have that control, the more control you have, the more more personal freedom you have because the the more your life, your concept of yourself and your your reality, what your life becomes and what it becomes for the people around you, the more it is what we want it to be. I think that is a really good place to end our re little session in this okay. vast sea of time where we both, our consciousness interacted. <laughs> Thank yes. you and... Uh, where can people find you at? Your work? Yeah, they can find me at uh, TomSterner.com. It's just my name, T-O-M-S-T-E-R-N-E-R. -E -E um, it's TomSterner.com. And, you know, they can get in touch with me there. Um, my email is Tom at TomSterner.com. They can email me. I read all my emails. I don't have somebody else read them. And I answer them, too. That was Thomas Turner sharing his thoughts on how your thoughts can shape your reality and change it if you choose it to. If you like the episode, don't forget to like, subscribe, share and comment. See you on the next episode.